Okay. So, how many of you, I know I asked this question last week, but, you know, I think once you hit 30, you start forgetting everything. So, how many of you have worked with or heard of the chi-square distribution before? Like, or heard it mentioned in a paper, right? You probably have heard it mentioned or seen um, maybe a representation of it. Like, if you've read a paper and you've seen something like this, like a chi-square distribution, a symbol like that will show up in the paper. Um, it is fundamentally different from what we've discussed up to this point with the T distribution and the normal distribution. We were able to have critical values that were both positive and negative, right? Well, you could, you would, you might say a really large negative value or a really large positive value are unusual to see. Okay, square distribution, um, we're only going to be looking at positive values. That's something to pay attention to. And so we'll dig into why that is um, as we get going. So we're going to look at this 2 by 2 table. And something I want you to get used to is when you're looking at a table, before you ever try to do anything with the table, try to understand exactly what type of study design it came from. What do, um, like, in this case, we have a cross-sectional survey. We don't have something that is, like, randomized. Uh, we didn't randomize people. Well, depending on how you want to argue. Someone argued in the last semester about randomization and the service in Vietnam. Um, but no, we're not going to consider that to be a random assignment. Um, so in this case, we're doing a cross-sectional survey. We're looking at what sleep problems and relationship to... Um, service in Vietnam. So we want to understand, are these things related to each other? Not necessarily, you know, that question, and this is something I just came from a number of meetings this morning, it is really common for people who are not more well-versed in statistics, even people who are versed in statistics, to say something like, okay, did service in Vietnam cause sleep problems? Or what's the driver behind sleep problems? Is it service in Vietnam? That's fundamentally not the question that we can answer, <laughs> given the data that we have. All right, this is not a randomized experiment, so we're not able to get to the level of causation. What we're asking is, do these two things appear to be dependent on each other? Are they related to each other? Um, you could phrase that a lot of ways, dependent on each other, related to each other. Does one of them provide information about the other? There's a whole lot of ways that it can be phrased. But I just want you to pay attention to that when you're thinking about communicating this type of work to others. If you start saying things like, this is a main driver, if you're in a business world, people love that word for some reason. Um, this, this drives this, or this causes this, or this is the root cause of this. That is not what we can get to using this cross-sectional survey. So be very careful of going down that road and using those kind of phrases when you're communicating this type of stuff with other audiences. In this case, you want to be very precise in saying, we're trying to understand, is there a relationship between these two? Are they dependent on each other? So before I actually go into anything else, based on what you see in this table, so take a couple minutes with a person next to you at the table. Do you think these things, uh, do you think sleep problems and service in Vietnam are related to each other? So sort of discuss what would you look at in the table, how much you go about deciding this. So I want to hear some initial thoughts. 
given that we haven't formalized the process to do this yet, do you think, or how would you go about establishing if we have evidence that these are related to each other or dependent on each other? How? I, I can look at the numbers. Tell me more about how I'm supposed to look at the numbers. Um, the number of people that served in Vietnam and the total, like, those with C probably that served in Vietnam is almost the same as those uh, with C problem that didn't serve in Vietnam. So, okay. So the numbers yeah. are pretty similar. So you're looking at 173, 173 and 160. Okay. Thoughts on so 173 and 160, they're a difference of 13. Okay. Question? Um, when you take the risk ratio and you consider the total in each group, you have a risk ratio of 1.4. So okay. So that's that's a key here. If you just look at the tables and you don't independent of looking at the totals. And you say, okay, 173 and 160 are pretty close to each other. What you've ignored is the proportion of people in the study that actually that served in Vietnam versus did not serve in Vietnam. Or the proportion of those with sleep problems as opposed to without sleep problems. So what we're trying to do here is develop a systematic process for saying, how do we go about establishing whether there's a relationship between these two things? Um, what we'll try to define is a situation under saying we're going to look at these totals, the totals here and the totals here, without looking at anything in the cells. And we will be able to say if these two things were perfectly independent of each other, we would expect to see these values in the cells. Okay, so. Imagine for a second, we'll look at this in uh, a few minutes. Imagine that we just didn't have any of those numbers in the cells, but we had the totals. We're going to be able to come up with a process and say, okay, if these two things are actually independent of each other, these are the numbers we would expect to see in each of these cells. And we're going to compare that with what we actually see, right? The expected versus the observed. And when we do that, we have the expected number versus the observed number. We're going to square those differences, add those differences up, and that's the building block for what we're doing with the chi-squared distribution. So as we go through this, I'm prefacing this because I know it can be difficult in the next few slides where we're changing it up and looking at different totals. Keep in mind what we're trying to do is develop a way to say, here's what I expect to happen under independence, and here's what I actually see. And we're going to, the chi-squared distribution allows us a way to actually formalize that decision. We create a test statistic and we decide if that test statistic, test statistic is large enough, we're going to reject our null hypothesis. Okay? Question? Will researchers, uh, when they publish, will they use risk ratios and chi-squared in their manuscripts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty common. Yeah. Um, often you're asking a little bit different question. Um, with this question with chi-squared, we're at, and we will look at risk ratio and odds ratios as well, but we're asking are these things related to each other? Are they dependent on each other? Um, it's another step to say, okay, at what, exactly how related are they to each other? So keep in mind with hypothesis testing, we care about whether we have evidence to meet a threshold, right? Um, and so we'll tie those two things together. Remember from last week, if we have a risk ratio um, or an odds ratio and we get a confidence interval for them, what value do we care about being in that confidence interval? One, right? Because in this case, one represents equivalence. Um, so keep that in mind as we keep going from here. Okay, so the first thing, we're going to look... Um, so these slides are good to have as a reference. Don't feel compelled to take full notes on each one of these. It's just breaking down ways in which we can dissect this table. So if we do this, what we've done is we've taken every single observation <clears throat> and we've divided it by 1783. 1783 is what in this table? 
the total number of observations that we have, the total number of people in the cross-sectional study. So we have these values, 0 0.097, 0 0.090. Each one of those tells you about a proportion of the total. So we're saying, okay, 9.7% of all of our people in this cross-sectional study served in Vietnam and have sleep problems. 47.7% did not serve in Vietnam and do not have sleep problems. Is that okay, where we're coming from with that? So this is simply taking each of your observed cells and dividing by the total number of observations in the data. So these things should add up to one. If they don't add up to one, <laughs> then there's probably something that's gone wrong. Um, one thing to notice is that if you do this yourself, you'll at some point you're going to have to round, right? You're not going to keep a whole bunch of decimals, so it may not be perfectly equal to one. It might be like 0.99 something or 1.00 something. But the idea is that if we took all of the decimals out, this would sum to one. So we refer to these as joint probabilities. Okay? And that's a fancy way of saying, okay, the joint probability of having served in Vietnam and having sleep problems is this. The joint probability of not serving in Vietnam and having sleep problems is 9.0%. So the joint probabilities have to do with the internal part of the table, the internal self. The marginal probabilities, maybe not surprisingly, have to do with the margins of the table. Okay? It's a really fancy naming scheme. So we're again we are dividing by 1783, but we're not doing it within the cells now. We're taking the information we were given on the outside, the totals, and we're dividing that by 1783. So does anyone want to take a shot at interpreting when we're taking 772 divided by 1783 and we get 0.43? What does that 0.43 tell me? Yeah, or 43%. But yeah, 43% of our population served in Vietnam. That 0.43 does not, is not conditional on sleep problems. It is simply service in Vietnam or not service in Vietnam. So given that we're taking that approach, these two numbers should always add to one. right? And as we look at larger tables where it's not just two by two any longer, however many rows you have, these proportions should all add up to one. And so a similar idea is down here. And we look at, we are looking down here at sleep problems only. So we can say 19% of our sample had sleep problems. And 81% of our sample did not. Okay, so that's what the marginal probabilities are talking about. So we have joint probabilities here, which have to do with the internal part of the table. Marginal probabilities have to do with the margins. So now notice our denominator has changed. Okay, up to this point we were dealing with 1783 in both cases. Now we are taking 772. These are referred to as conditional probabilities really fun uh, terminology. Why do you think we're referring to it as a conditional probability? It's only the condition that that line of people served in Vietnam. Yes, we are conditioning and saying we want to know the probability of sleep problems given that there was service in Vietnam. Okay, so we're starting from the assumption that we're only paying attention to those who served in Vietnam. So in this case, of those who served in Vietnam, 22.4% have sleep problems, and 77.6% do not. Right? And compare that with the overall proportions, 0.43. 
So we started with saying in the general of all of the people in the sample, 19% had sleep problems and 81% did not. For those in Vietnam, 22.4% had sleep problems, 77.6% did not. So what we can see is that the proportion of those, or for those who served in Vietnam, they're more likely, at least in this sample, to have sleep problems than if we were looking at everybody in aggregate. The question is, does this difference, or this what we observe in the sample, does that give us enough information to generalize to the population and say that this holds in the population? Right here, we're seeing 22.4%. Is that big enough or different enough from those who didn't serve in Vietnam for us to actually make a conclusion about the population? Or is it possible that this is just due to our sample and the variability that we got in our sample? So if we look at, and so this is just repeating the same approach in this, in this case for those who did not serve in Vietnam. So let's think about this. We have 22.4% and in this case we have 15.8%. So what this is, this is the proportion of those who have sleep problems who served in Vietnam. This is the proportion to those who did not serve in Vietnam. So, well, our question is, we clearly see that in this sample alone, there's a difference. We can even identify exactly what that difference is. The question is, is that difference big enough for us to actually say that sleep problems are dependent on service in Vietnam? So that's, this is where, so remember when we were talking about the normal distribution and the t-distribution? We could see that there were differences between things, right? In the sample, we could see a certain size of difference. But the question, the reason that we needed those distributions was so that we could actually ask and say, okay, is this difference that we see in the sample big enough for us to conclude that there's a difference in the population? The same idea is going to apply here. So what we're going to do is actually formalize this idea of independence as a hypothesis. Okay, hypothesis testing is nice. It gives us a repeatable way to approach our work. And so we're going to say, if we're starting with the null hypothesis, of our proportions being equal. We're going to translate in that case as saying if we look up here, probability of D given E is equal to the probability of D given not E. Okay, that's what the C refers to complement. You can think about it as not. It's the, uh, it's the other space. So we're going to work... Wow, that's a little symbol. Um, we're going to work with this as our null hypothesis. That these things are actually independent. And we're going to... And by saying it, putting it this way, Right, this is the thing, remember the null hypothesis is what we would like to reject. We're trying to gather evidence against it. In this case, we're trying to, does, what does that mean we're trying to gather evidence for? Dependence. Right, so we're starting under the assumption of independence and we're trying to gather evidence to say, do we have enough evidence to say that these things are dependent? So, if D and E are independent, this goes back to a little bit of probability. These are just the statements down here. If D and E are independent events, 
then the probability of D and E occurring is the same as the probability of D times the probability of E. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to test the probability of D and E occurring, and we're going to say is the probability of D and E, sorry, I'm going to say, I'll just leave it as a symbol like that for now, D and E occurring equal to the probability of D times the probability of E. So what this is saying is if, if the disease and exposure are truly independent of each other, then this is going to hold. Okay. Of course, given a sample, we're never going to see this hold exactly, right? So what we can do with our sample data is we can calculate these numbers. We can calculate the probability of D and E occurring. Now we can calculate the probability of D and the probability of E. This is why we just talked about marginal probabilities and conditional probabilities. And so what we're going to ask is, are these two things close enough to each other or you could put it the other way, are they far enough away from each other for us to reject independence? Okay, that's the fundamental idea that we're going after here. <clears throat> so, given that this is what we're going to, this is going to be our method, how do we do this with a table? So we have some nice blue highlights here. So the first thing we can do is we're going to calculate the probability of the disease or the event occurring. And that is sleep problems in this case. Right? Everybody on board with that? So we have the disease is sleep problems and we're considering exposure to be service in Vietnam. Okay, so this goes back to, so that 0.19 that you see highlighted what type of probability is that? Marginal. It's a marginal probability. It's sitting in the margins. It's a good way to remember that. So that gives us the probability of D. So we can record this. The probability of D is going to be 0.19. OK? the probability of E, right? The, in this case, we're talking about the probability of exposure. This is .43. Everybody all right with that, where these numbers are coming from? OK. So where in the table am I going to find the probability of D and E? upper left, right? The probability of D and E is saying the probability of the disease and the exposure, both occurring, which is 0 0.097. Okay, so if you actually multiply these two numbers together, what does that come out to be? 0 0.08. One seven? Okay. So what we're seeing is that, like we expected, these two numbers are not ever going to be exactly equal. But the question is, is this difference that we see, is that big enough for us to reject our null hypothesis of independence? And right now we're sort of just like saying, well, maybe <laughs> we don't have a way to actually formalize that. Is this, before we move on from this point, is this clicking for you? Okay, I just want to make sure because if we move on from here and I'm referring back to independence and dependence, um, if something is not clicking, be sure to ask before we jump into more stuff. Okay?
Okay, so it's going to feel <clears throat> now like we're just returning to things we've done already. That's a good thing. <clears throat> Hypothesis testing has a standardized set of steps. Right? We are going to state our null in the alternative. We're going to calculate the value of our test statistic. We're going to find the p-value, and then we're going to state a conclusion. So given, to, given what we've actually developed up to this point, what's our null hypothesis going to be for this type of scenario? Hint. It's right there. What does that mean? So not, you don't have to repeat the letters to me, but we're working under the assumption of what? are independent of each other. And we're trying to gather evidence against that null hypothesis. Okay? You've put the burden of proof on you. right? You have to show that there's enough evidence to reject this assumption of independence. What we haven't done so far is actually figure out how we're going to do this with a test statistic. Right? And this is where the chi-square distribution comes in. So this is more or less just repeating the example that we just went through. Under the null hypothesis, we're going to say the probability of D and E occurring is equal to the probability of D times the probability of E. Right? That's working under the assumption of independence. In our alternative case, we're going to say those things are not equal to each other. We don't necessarily care. So notice the, how the alternative is stated. Because up to this point, we have made a relatively big deal about whether we're going to do one-sided or two-sided tests. Here, we're going to say, OK, independence, we don't necessarily care in which direction this occurs. We know that either direction is going to give us evidence toward independence. Right? So we're not testing a direction here. We're just testing whether these two things are equivalent. So this is just, if you're thinking back to how we actually have labeled the tables A, B, C, and D, and all of the numbers, this is just a way to actually state the calculation. This is a more formal description of it. But all that this is is a restatement of the example we just went through. So I don't find it. Um, this is more reference for you if you want a more standardized way to um, approach things. But don't consider it, um, if, if you're comfortable, I find it easier often to just work from what we've done in an example, which is why I preface this with an example. Okay. So with the test statistic, we went through and we found proportions and we found probabilities and we kind of wanted to decide, okay, are these two things equal to each other? Well, it turns out that it's a bit easier to work on a count scale rather than a probability scale. And so what I mean by that? At the start of this lecture, I said, we're going to <clears throat> work under the assumption of So how I like, say that you teach how you were taught, I found this to be a useful way to think about approaching the chi-square distribution, is that we have a two by two table, right? So we have A, B, C, and D. Watch, I probably didn't even label that like I should. Uh, OK. It's we're good. So we have A, B, C, and D. Okay? And we're going to call this the observed 2 by 2 table. And keep in mind that while we're talking about 2 by 2 right now, this naturally extends to much larger tables than just 2 by 2. Um, You can think about there being another table here that is the table we would expect to see if the disease and exposure were actually independent of each other. Right? Because this is 
just our observed data, right? But there's another table that we could develop And this notation, I'm certain, will come back and bite me at some point, but we'll just roll with it for now. So we have observed values here. We can also go through and say, given the numbers that we know, right, given these marginal probabilities, if they were actually to be independent, what would these counts look like? So for each one of these, we can actually end up comparing this expected count under independence to what we actually see. And what we're actually going to do is take these differences, square them, and add them all up. Okay, so this is, this is where the chi-squared distribution is coming from. We are <coughs> working under, instead of a null or a single value, this is what we would expect to see with independence versus what we actually see. So let's take a look at, sorry, I skipped over that. <clears throat> so let's take a look in our example here. How do we go about developing this value? All right, because it's nice to be able to say this, and in theory it sounds nice, but where does it actually come from? So if we're looking over here, so the expected value of A, so we want to know if these two variables are independent of each other. What would we actually expect to see here? So this is more or less the formula to actually compute the expected count. So notice what it is. A plus C, which is the number of those, is this the disease or the exposure up here? Which one? disease. So we're taking the number of those diseased multiplied by the number of those exposed and we're dividing by n which is the total number in the sample. Everybody alright with where that's coming from? So what we're trying to say is if these two things, the disease and the exposure, are truly independent of each other what we should see in this cell is exactly this calculation. Okay? That, and what this is saying is that this proportion does not necessarily, that this proportion, uh, sorry, it'll be easier when we go through an example. But this is the expected count for B, C, and D. Okay? So the expected count for A, expected count for B, C, and D. So what I want you to pay attention to <clears throat> is not necessarily how to go through and do this calculation each time, but when you're doing a chi-squared test, under the hood it's creating this expected table, or the expected counts that should go in each one of these. Question? No. Okay. So, we end up developing the expected counts and our observed counts. Um, the two bullets down here are more or less just convention. So, expected E1, 2, 3, and 4, and observed 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this, of course, is uh, specific to a 2x2 two two table. You could imagine if you have, let's say, three phases or three levels of the disease and maybe four levels of the exposure, this, these get a lot larger, right? There are now 12 cells that we're dealing with rather than just four. Question? So just to confirm notation for this class, EA mm -hmm. is the same as E1? Yes, okay. yes. EA is the same as E1. Um, you won't really be asked on a quiz or anything. <laughs> um, it'll be very clear what we're asking okay. for. But yes, EA is the same as E1. Um, and just is everybody all right with that in terms of notation? Okay. So we're going to form a chi-squared statistic. <clears throat> 
So for every one of these um, cells, right? in this case we have the four different cells, we are going to take the difference between the observed and the expected, square that difference, and divide by the expected count. Okay? So this is, and this is specific to a 2x2 two two table, but you can imagine this is easily extended to tables that are much larger than 2x2. Two two. In the case where we have three um, phases of disease, four levels of exposure, right, we would be su summing from 1 to 12 across the 12 cells. Okay. So this value actually provides us with our test statistic value. So you can think about this. Similarly, when we went through and we created our test statistic value for the t-distribution or the normal distribution, this is that same idea. We are trying to actually create, so for the normal distribution, we would sometimes get maybe a value of a z-value of maybe 3.01, right? In this case, we're developing a way to get a test statistic again. It's not going to look the same as uh, when we're dealing with the normal and the t-distribution, but it's going to serve the same function. So let's think about why this might work in a little bit more detail. So if the null hypothesis is true, question? So, so, so this will be a value um, no, this is going to be an overall value. So we're adding up. So for each one, for each cell, you can think about we're going to do this. We're going to take the observed minus the expected divided by the expected. Okay, and so that's going to happen for each one of those cells. And what the summation here means is we're going to add up all those numbers from each of the cells. Okay. So intuitively, let's think about what how this might play out in cases where, or why this might play out and work as it does. So if the null is true, right, our null hypothesis is that we're dealing with independence, we would expect the, obser the observed and the expected counts to be pretty close to each other, right? Which, what that means is that this overall sum would be relatively small, right? If the observed and the expected are close to each other, then this overall sum is going to be relatively small. Um, if the null is false and they're actually dependent on each other, these differences, observed minus expected and then squaring that, is going to become pretty large. So think about this. There's a, there are a couple ways we could have made this decision. Let's say we wanted to take So this is just an example of ways in which, or why we might have chosen uh, this approach. We could have just taken the absolute value of the observed minus the expected, right? But instead, in this case, we're choosing to square this difference. We really want to exaggerate the difference. All right. Exaggerate, so we want to really say if there's a difference, it's going to make a big impact on this value, right? Because let's say that the actual difference between these two things was four. In this case, that would only contribute an error of four. In this case, it contributes an error of 16. So what that does, and this is prior to getting into linear regression, but it's penalizing big misses. It's penalizing large differences between the observed and expected versus, um, let's say we had a difference of four and then a difference of eight. So in this case, that would only be like a difference in impact of four, right? This would be an error of eight, error of four. In this case, we have 16 versus 64. This is actually a four times impact, right? In this case, the magnitude is actually a change of 48. But what this is doing is it's penalizing large misses, much more than something like this does.
the reason that I'm saying this is don't always take for granted that we go through and we square differences. There are often reasons for doing it. Um, when we get to linear regression and we look at um, square, sum of squared errors, there's a reason that we square it instead of doing something like the absolute value. So, why is our test statistic always positive? Yeah, we're squaring, right? We can't get negative numbers out of this. Um, what's the smallest value the chi-squared statistic can take on? Zero. Zero. And that would occur in what situation? The tables are the same. Or you have exact independence. Um, but it is always going to be positive, which is a change from what we've dealt with up to this point with the Z and the T statistic, which could take on positive or negative values. So this is a representation of what the chi-squared distribution ends up looking like. So let's think a little bit about why this might be the case. So around here, so if we look at, remember the area under the curve for the t distribution and the normal distribution, what did that sum to? One, right? Well, we're going to look at the same idea here, where the area under this curve is going to sum to one, but now it's all concentrated on one side. So again, this means that whatever value, chi-squared value we have here, it's not really unlikely to see that. But as we get further and further out here into more extreme chi-squared test statistics, it's much less likely to see something as or more extreme than that value. So recall that when we're discussing the meaning of a p-value, that is the probability of observing a test statistic as or more extreme than what we did. So if we get a really large chi-squared test statistic, we're saying the probability of seeing something larger than that is out in this tail. It's a very small probability. Okay. So there's going to be something. Um, it's always fun to talk about degrees of freedom because they're so they make so much sense. Um, but Degrees of the chi-square distribution does depend on degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom <coughs> in the chi-square distribution depends on how many rows and columns you have in your table. So just think just remember this. Your degrees of freedom depend on the size of your table. Alright? So in most cases, we're going to be dealing with a two by two table. And in that case, we just have one degree of freedom. But when we, uh, on Wednesday, maybe near the end of today, we'll extend this to deal with tables of, that are larger than 2 by 2. In that case, the degrees of freedom changes, and it's something you have to pay attention to. So what's happening here is if we look Z1 up to ZK, we're going to say these are independent, standard, normal, random variables. Okay, so each one of these is has a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution. If we add all of these together, we actually get a chi-squared distribution with k degrees of freedom. So what I, the reason that we have this slide up here is to say this chi-squared distribution isn't just coming out of the blue. It actually can be represented as the sum of a bunch of squared uh, normal random variables. Okay, so the properties and the, th and the things that we're going to look at, are they don't just appear <laughs> from nowhere. Um, so, like with the T distribution, the degrees of freedom, in this case it's referred to as K, affects the shape of the distribution that we're dealing with. Okay, and we'll explore in a little bit to see what uh, that effect of K might actually look like. So, um, before jumping into this next part, let's take a break. Um, about 11.10, and we'll come back and pick up with the slide.
Jesus. Something I want to mention in case you have personal interest in it. So I am teaching a two-day R programming course as part of the Public Health Institute on May 22nd and 23rd. I believe it's like 9 to 5 and then 8 to 5 the next day. Um, so it'll be an intense couple of days. Um, but more or less, we're going to go through. It's going to be much, in much greater depth um, than what we've discussed with R in this class. Um, it'll be more tailored to the entire um, data analysis pipeline. So taking the raw data file and actually getting maybe good representations of the data, getting the data clean. It will not be statistics heavy. Actually, it won't be, there will not be a lot of statistics in general other than looking at like means and standard deviations and stuff. It's much more on getting raw data, cleaning it, um, creating nice looking representations of it. Um, so it's much, I would think much more about it as like the, an exploratory phase, exploratory data analysis. Um, so if you're interested, take a look. I can I have the syllabus um, written out, but more or less I'm going to walk you through um, my approach, and this is not everybody's approach to working with uh, starting with a raw data file, getting it read in and actually doing the manipulation and the checks on it, um, evaluation of data integrity, doing that within R, and then actually maybe getting it in shape for doing the analysis that you want to do. So that's what the course will look like. Questions? So how do we like register? Um, I believe it's just a standard, it's a one credit course. So again, that um, often, I can't really like, do much about the cost piece. It's a one credit course. Um, it depends on, I don't, know exactly what that is for the Public Health Institute, um, but I can, so I do plan to record everything that we do in the class. Um, I'm not 100% sure yet if I'm allowed to make that public under <laughs> the... Public to the university. I, maybe, because they're paying me specifically to teach 
this course. And so I don't know about the rules about making that, how widely I can share that. However, I will explore that option. But if you are interested in doing that class, it will be a two day, pretty intense uh, seminar. It's, I think it's just a pass fail, you know, like A through F. I don't know what you would grade in two days. So with our project, uh -huh. in this class, yeah. and things like that, is there going to be overlap with a, a good deal? Not really, that? no. This, I mean, what we're trying to do in this project is trying to get, so we're going to give you relatively clean data, um, and you're going to need to uh, decide what you need from the data in order to do various statistical tests like regression. Um, this class is much more focused on getting to know sort of the ins and outs of our studio, what it can do, what it can't do, um, how you, because that process of getting the raw data and getting it to a point where you can actually run statistics on it, more or less people have different numbers for this, but usually it takes about 80% of the analysis time. About 80% of your time in working with data is going to be spent getting it, cleaning it, getting it in a format. Once you have it in a good format, running the statistics on it is not that hard. But it takes a long time <laughs> to get into that format. Um, also, I know a lot of you might be looking to make like publication quality graphics and things like that, and we will look at some of the different libraries in R that enable that. But again, I will do my best. Um, I'm of the mind where I like to try to make things as available as I can, but I just don't know their limitations yet. So just something to keep in mind. And there are a number, they just released a really nice R for data science that has a corresponding online like free, uh, free version. And that has a, really, a lot of really nice uh, approaches to doing data cleaning itself. So I'll try to make that available to you guys when I can. Um, but for now, we're not going to do data visualization. We're going to dig more into actually doing more statistics. So what we're going to look at here is we're going to actually look at some actual data. So we're trying to evaluate the association. Again, association is another word for dependence, another word for related to. There's a whole lot of ways you can phrase this. Um, I remember teaching this or in grad school when um, at Arizona State we had a, a really large um, population of students from China and they were very new to the English language and so it was very frustrating when you tried to say there are actually eight different ways you can try to interpret this. Um, so just because if you, if you prefer one over the other, like association or related to or dependence on, use that. That's totally fine. But my point is that it is not necessarily just one way to phrase um, the independence or dependence stuff. So we're going to start with a question. Does an association exist between race and survival and survival to hospital discharge in cases of non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It's like, whoa, that's a very long statement. <laughs> very, um, so what is it asking? We just stated it now, but what are we actually interested in knowing in more uh, <laughs> amenable terms, terms that we can actually maybe talk to somebody else outside of this audience about? What are we trying to look at? Dependence or not? Dependence between what? Right, so we're looking at, is there dependence between race and survival to discharge? Okay, so when I say survival to discharge, what does that mean? Just so everyone's on the same page. Yeah, you live to get out of the hospital, right? Okay, so that's not a very difficult thing to measure. You either walked out of the hospital or you didn't. Um, I don't know about questions where they walk out and then came back in. Um, but so we're going to use an alpha level of 0 0.01. So why would we decide to use 0 0.01 rather than our standard uh, 0 
it's like you're determining a certain market you want to show up yeah. about the relationship. Yeah, you're putting a greater burden a greater burden of evidence on the data than you would have in the alpha equals 0 0.05 case. All right, so we expect we need to see a p-value of 0 0.04 is no longer sufficient for us to make a conclusion of dependence. So our hypotheses, race and survival of the hospital discharge are independent. The alternative is that they're dependent. So I realize that the table can be a little bit confusing. I'm not saying that 84 is the expected value for A. I'm saying, so 84 is the observed value. Okay. So what I'd like you to do uh, for the next few minutes is actually go through and try to work this problem. So figure out what the expected counts for B, C, and D are. Again, very rarely will you actually end up doing this by hand, but when you're calling like chi-squared tests and things like that in R or in SAS, this is implicitly what's going on. Right. Aren't you glad that you don't have to do all of this by hand <laughs> each time? Right? It's such fun. You can imagine if you get beyond two by two tables, to like four by three or something like that. It's a lot of calculation to have to do. How are the calculations going? <laughs> 
All right? Okay. So again, this process is not something like on a quiz, I'm not going to ask you, give you a table, and be like, go through and calculate the chi-squared test statistic. Um, it's much more about interpretation, but this, I think it's invaluable to know what's going on under the hood. When you look at like a chi-squared test statistic value that comes out, this is what's happening. So, unless I've made a major calculational error, these are about the expected counts that you should see. So, what do you guys think? Before we actually go through and actually look at the chi-squared test statistic, based on what you see here, do you think this should end up being, do you think it's evidence of dependence or not? The point is, it's very difficult to just eyeball it. <laughs> Right, you can say, well, we have a difference of 27, we have a difference of 28, difference of, in that case, what, we're looking at 27 again. So, it's hard to know, though, because we're not just summing up, remember from the calculation, we're not just summing up all the differences. What are we doing to those squared we take the expected value minus the observed, I don't know why I just drew that. We square this, okay, and we divide by the expected count. All right, so it's not just the magnitude of the difference, it also matters what the actual expected count is. Is it dimensional to the observed minus expected or what? Um, it doesn't, well, up here it doesn't really matter, but um, typically I would, typically it's going to be expected minus observed. That's going to be when we're looking at how we write it in terms of linear regression and stuff. It's going to be expected minus observed, but um, it's kind of up to you. And the nice part is here, it doesn't matter at all, right? Whichever order we write it in, we're going to end up getting uh, squares. So, if we look at what these values actually come out to, because you don't actually want to go through and do this yourself, we get 28.42. So the, the part we haven't gotten to yet is saying, well, we don't have an idea of what the cutoff values are like. <laughs> right? For a normal distribution or a t distribution, we knew that if we saw a critical value or a test statistic that was in the, like above 2.2 .2 or something, that we would probably be rejecting the null hypothesis. Here, we haven't said anything about that. Um, so, in lieu of, I, I'll, I'll try and go through and give you some rules of thumb, but when, in this case, if you wanted to do this in SAS or in R, these are the commands that you would use. Basically, there is the probability of observing something more as or more extreme than this, under the assumption of independence, is about zero. Okay, so this is similar to seeing a very, very large, like four or five value in like the normal distribution. There's just very little chance that it's, um, in, in other words, it's giving you a lot of evidence for dependence. Uh, oh, one thing else, one other thing I want to mention. You see this one at the end in both um, SAS and in R? That represents the degrees of freedom. So I mentioned that the degrees of freedom is one for a two by two table. Um, in whatever size table, it's the number of rows minus one multiplied by the number of columns minus one. So in a two by two table, that's just one by one. Um, but when we get into larger tables, like 3 by 3 or 3 by 2, then the degrees of freedom start changing a little bit, and that affects the distribution. But more or less, um, don't forget this piece, because just like the t-distribution, it does affect um, the shape of the distribution, and it affects the resulting p-values that we get. So if you forget, um, I'm not sure if it defaults to a value or if it will kick an error out to you. My hope is that it just kicks an error out to you rather than assuming something. 
Um, but it should, if you don't put that one in, it will ask you four degrees of freedom. It will say something is not specified. So this is an example of what, um, just, we're not going to run through it in here, but this is just an example of what this could look like if you were to manually put the data into SAS. Looks like a lot of fun, right? Um, so don't worry too much about having to know what these various pieces do. This is more or less so that you can just run through an example and see it happen in SAS. Um, most of the time you're going to be dealing with data that you already have. So you won't have to go through these steps of actually doing any, any manual input. Um, so again, this is just to give you an example of a way to look at things. It's not necessarily the recommended way to do it in SAS, but it is something that will give you at least decent output in these kind of cases. Hmm? Oh, right here? Um, I believe... Hmm. I don't know why I did that. I'll have to get back to you on that piece. Um, yeah. And um, some some suggestion in the line said you ordered by like the Right. But that one just didn't make sense for Um other than a convention, again in SAS, I don't I often am not one who's gonna be able to tell you why one convention is better than another. Um so I won't overextend or claim to be able to say why. Um let me do a little exploration on why they might recommend it. It's possible. Um, sometimes the recommendations that come up for SAS or something uh, are due to a change in the version of SAS, and that might be part of it. I'm not 100% sure, though. Okay. So again, you'll get something nice, a little chi-squared. Um, this is just an example of what this would look like in R, a little more condensed. Um, Again, it looks a little bit confusing because we're doing manual entry of data, but very rarely are you going to ever do this um, by yourself. Most of the time you're going to be doing this uh, from a data set that you already have. Question? So the, um, the statistic we get from the chi-squared, is that chi-squared? Is that the same thing? Um, with chi-squared? So we're just, what do you mean the well, statistic? You know, like when I read a paper and I see they got a Pearson's. So Pearson correlation coefficient has only to, you're assuming in that case that you're working with, well, for what we'll discuss in this class, we're talking about being between continuous variables. Okay, so this is a measure of association or dependence for two categorical variables, right? Okay. Versus when we talk about two continuous, which is what we'll do uh, starting next week with correlation, that's when we're going to introduce like the Pearson correlation coefficient. Well, Pearson, yeah, so that's different. Uh, Pearson's chi-squared. Okay, so just in terms oh, okay. of the name, okay. um, igno I wish it didn't say Pearson's, but yeah. just um, for it's now, just think it's we're, it's different things. We're dealing with different types of data. Okay, so the last piece, at least for this set of, we still have another set of slides for the week, but in the 2 by 2 case, and this does not apply to tables larger than this, we might, you can imagine, we could do a test of proportions, or we could do this chi-squared approach, where we test whether there's dependence or not. Right, in a 2 by 2 table, so think about how we phrased um, things before. The, we said the chi-squared distribution is just a sum of normal distributions squared, right? That was just a slide we had mentioned earlier. Um, so for this problem that we just did, we could actually use a z-test. We could actually go through and do um, a test of proportions like we did and uh, did before spring break. So how we could do this is we could phrase and say, 
And remember that when we went through this derivation, we started out with p1 equals to p2 is equal to p2. And then we went through and tried to state what that means in terms of the conditional probabilities in the table. Well, we could, in this case, given our 2 by 2 table, we could just ask a question about whether the proportions are equal to each other. Right? We can have a proportion of those who were diseased given each exposure. Right? And we could compare those proportions. And we have the tools to do that. So the question is, should we? Or why might we choose to do one or the other? So if we actually went through and did, the in this example, the two sample, um, or we did actually a test of proportions, we would end up getting a z-value of 5.32, which we can recover by taking the square root of 28.33, which was our chi-squared distribution value. So this is specific to 2 by 2 tables. Um, but there's a reason that maybe we would want to do this as opposed to um, using the chi-squared test, for example. So the test that we've done up to this point with chi-squared, the alternative was two-sided. right? Either direction gives us evidence for, uh, we can use that to gather evidence for dependence. Right? It was a two-sided alternative. We didn't care in which direction the difference existed. But perhaps we want to be able to test a one-direction alternative. Right? That we're not just interested in whether they're dependent, but we would actually want to know if there's a difference in a particular direction. We can do that in a 2 by 2 table by using the test for proportions, or the Z statistic. So it's, it comes down to a question of what, question, what are you trying to answer? If you're concerned about actually testing whether one proportion is larger than another in a 2 by 2 table, you can use the test for proportions that we've learned up to this point. However, if you're concerned more generally, just about whether they're dependent on each other, the chi-squared test is going to be the right approach. Um, in terms of what generalizes, uh, this test for proportions breaks down after we get beyond the 2 by 2 table. The notion, this chi-squared test, the chi-squared test statistic, that applies to tables as large as we want to make them, conditional on meeting some other assumptions. So, in terms of generalizability, the chi-squared test is the right way to go. Um, but for a 2 by 2 table, it sort of depends on the research question that you're asking. So you could take either approach, depending on what you uh, want to know. Okay? So, that's really not... Um, so these last few slides are more to just let you know that for 2 by 2 tables, there is a nice connection between chi-squared and the z-distribution. It's not necessarily to say you should do one or the other, but it depends, your approach should depend on your research question. Okay? So, chi-squared distribution. Nice, neat, quick, right? We're done with it. No, there's, there's more to say. <laughs> um, so, think about some, uh, up to this point when we've worked with tables, what are some of the, let's see... Up to this point, we've made, um, we haven't really discussed, uh, let's say, assumptions. Like, how many observations do we need to have in each table? Right, for example, if we had an expected count of, like, two, <laughs> or three, or five, or very small numbers, or we had an observed case where we only had, like, maybe one observation for a combination of the disease and the exposure, we have to think about, okay, is that enough? I mean, clearly the answer probably is no. <laughs> but what we're going to discuss with um, the exact tests and paired data is, 
okay, what can you do when you don't meet these sort of underlying assumptions about what the counts need to be in each of the cells? Put another way, um, if you've, how many of you have heard of like Fisher's exact test? Nah, little, yeah, it comes up. So this is really an answer. What we're going to discuss now is an answer to the question of what if A, B, C, or D is less than five? And this is specific to a two by two table. But then we start getting into issues of where things we just have too few observations to do uh, approximation. Um, before spring break. We, we have talked about exact tests before, where we use, um, we end up using the binomial distribution to calculate exact p-values, as opposed to doing the approximation approach that we used otherwise. So we're going to discuss things similarly here as to when you actually need to go through and use an exact approach, Fisher's exact test, as opposed to using an approximation. All right, so the sample sizes here are problematic. If you only have one person that um, we're looking at dieting behaviors by sex, we have one male who's also dieting. Well, it may be that any conclusions we make from this sample, they may not hold up when we get to our larger population because we just don't have enough observations, right? I mean, it's, it's right to be skeptical of this, of this particular data, but this does come up. Um, if you're doing, let's say, uh, pilot studies or you're doing a situation where perhaps it's hard to uh, recruit subjects for whatever reason, you end up with a lot smaller uh, sample size. And so these issues do arise. What we've lost here is when we're at the chi-squared and the z-test, they don't give good approximations any longer. Remember, when we're using approximations, we are able to use approximations because we have large enough sample sizes. But when we don't meet those sample size uh, thresholds, then we have to think about a different approach. So if we're looking at this example for dieting in teenagers, we have 12 females and 12 males. Under the null, right, the null is assuming independence. We would expect that if these two things were independent, that those 10 dieters would be evenly distributed between males and females because we have the same number of males and females in uh, in the study. Does that make sense? So if we had, uh, let's say, three quarters of our sample was male and one quarter was female, we would expect to see three quarters, assuming independence, we would expect to see three quarters of the dieters that were male and one quarter that were female. Um, so the question is, how unusual is this imbalance if we assume that the null hypothesis is in fact true. So we can work out a p-value that tells us exactly how unusual a 1 to 9 split is. Don't worry about how this is going to happen. Again, it's nice to have the point where we can say the computer worries about certain things. And we deal with something called the hypergeometric distribution and again, you don't need to worry about that. Um, but this is the foundation of Fisher's exact test. But intuitively, before we dive into using the test and hammering away and looking at p-values, given that you would expect a 50-50 split, do you think that this provides evidence that dieting and gender are dependent on each other? Before we ever get into actually looking at numbers. Yes. Yeah. Right? We see a 90-10 split in the dieters when, in fact, under uh, the assumption of independence, we would expect to see a 50-50 split. 
So intuitively, before we do anything else, we should assume that this is probably going to give us evidence that gender and uh, dieting are related to each other, are dependent on each other, are associated with each other, however you want to phrase that. So this is giving us, um, this is just an exact uh, description of how you would do this in R. So what we're doing is we're just putting these two rows together. We're taking 1 and 9 and 11 and 3 together, and we're putting them together in a matrix. And we're just running fisher.test on that data. Okay, there's not anything too secret about how we approach this. So let's take a look at the output. We see a p-value of 0 0.003, right? I mean, it's pretty small. So in this case, we're going to consider this to be evidence that these variables are dependent on each other. Um, let's say we didn't have the p-value there, and we were just looking at a confidence interval. Um, in this case, we're looking at uh, the odds ratio, the confidence interval for the odds ratio. Okay, don't worry too much, but just looking at the confidence interval itself for an odds ratio, what value do we care about being in that confidence interval? One, right? It's pretty clear that one is not a part of that interval, right? So this is just a way to, there are multiple pieces of output here that would lead us to conclude that these variables are dependent on each other. Um, this is an example of how you would do this in SAS. Again, Pretty rare. I would not expect you to um, almost ever. And sorry, this uh, 111 could go down here, but it doesn't really matter where you place it as long as it's after the semicolon. Um, this is just a way to run and get the same results in SAS. So, something to consider is that we can always do the exact test. So you could run Fisher's exact test on any data that you want. The issue is that it gets slower as the tables become larger, as the size of the data becomes larger. Um, so our preference is to use an approximation. And we can use an approximation when we have sufficient sample size. But as a general rule of thumb, if you have any of your four cells in a 2x2 two two table that are less than 5, Fisher's exact test is the right way to go. Okay. Um, my other thing, <laughs> try to plan, you know, you would love to be able to plan your study so that you're not getting cell counts of 1 <laughs> or 2. It's always preferable to have more observations than fewer because with 1, that's a really difficult thing to say. Like, you only have 10 dieters and just one of them happened to be male. Again, it's a question of um, sample size. So we could make larger tables. And don't worry, we're not going to calculate this by hand, even as much fun as you can imagine that is. Right, because it's possible, while we've discussed two by two tables up to this point, it's pretty normal in practice to maybe have three different exposures, or four different exposures. Or perhaps um, your particular event doesn't, isn't just a yes or a no. Maybe there's various levels of that event. Okay. So in this case, we have a 3 by 2 table. So before we ever get into anything else, how many degrees, of, if I were to do uh, chi-squared here, how many degrees of freedom do I have? Two. All right, so number of rows minus one multiplied by the number of columns minus one. So in this case, we're multiplying two <coughs> by one. Okay. Um, and I haven't actually written it out, but I'm not saying that. I'm saying it is like r minus one times c minus one. Okay. So given what we have here, we actually have a pretty even distribution across exposure. Right? Is that 
Um, and this would be something that in, uh, like, say, randomized study, where you're in control of who goes into what group, this is something that you would see, where you're randomly allocating people so that in the end, the number of people in each of the exposure groups is close, uh, or roughly equivalent. Now, in terms of what we see for whether they had an event occur, what are your thoughts as far as uh, equivalence of event across these different exposures? Close? No? So this is one issue, is that if you actually wrote out the percentage, right? You went through and calculated the percentage of each of these exposures that had um, the event occur. The decimals might not, the, dec the fractions might not look that different from each other. But what's happening here is we've started with the same number of people in each of the exposure groups. And yet what we're saying is um, we're increasing in case of, uh, as compared to aspirin, we're increasing by like 50%. And then we're more or less doubling um, the risk with placebo. So even though you, if so, this is again, if you were to translate this to just looking at decimals, it might be difficult to try to discern whether there's a similarity or a difference. But here, since we know that we have an even relatively um, equivalent number of people across the different exposures, it's, we should just say, okay, these appear to be dependent on each other. And so we might want to test whether P1 is equal to P2 is equal to P3. Well, this falls a little bit outside of our ideas about how to do a hypothesis tests, right? Up to this point, we've been pretty used to saying P1 is equal to P2, P2 is equal to P3, but we haven't really stated it in terms of three uh, probabilities. So the question becomes, so the null is going to be fine. The null is that all three of these probabilities are equivalent to each other. Put another way, if those three probabilities are equivalent, that means that the event is not dependent on the exposure. Okay, Disease is not dependent on the exposure. So the question is, what is the alternative? All right, it's easy enough to say, okay, our null is that they're all equal to each other. The alternative is... There's a number of different ways we could think about it. How we're going to define it here is if any of the three probabilities are different from the others, we are going, that's, that's going to be considered our alternative hypothesis. Right? Because think about the um, opposite. If we say our null is that P1 is equal to P2 is equal to P3, we can gather evidence against that if we show that any one of those probabilities is different from another. Right? P1 could still be equal to P2, but if we show P3 is different, we're good to go. It's not necessary that we show that P1 is different from P2 and that P1 is different from P3. All we have to do is show that any pair of those are not equivalent to each other. Questions? So what, what do we gain by comparing all of them together? Why can't we do each one twice a um, so we're starting, so I mean, we're just trying to define this in terms of a single test, right? So you could test these um, individually, but it would not necessarily be representative of the study that you did, right? Where you have three different exposure groups. But what if, what if, what if exposure one was associated with an exposure two wasn't? Oh, sure. But you could look test, at a smaller table. But this test would tell us Absolutely. Us. Sure, you could look at, um, I mean, so this is a pretty common... So if you were to do this or take this approach and you found that the exposure or the disease was dependent on the exposure, you actually haven't probably answered the question, maybe the question of interest is, okay, which one of these exposures are pr producing this difference? Is it possible that two of the exposures actually are independent of each other when it comes to disease outcome? And so often you'd start here and then you would want to do subtests within each pair. Uh, 
Right? So you figure out that, OK, it's clear that these things um, are dependent on each other. And now I'm going to actually drill down and take the subsets. So we have three exposures. I would take, do three different 2 by 2 tables. And you could actually figure out maybe which one is different. Does that make sense? So this is, again, just a way of rephrasing our null and all alternatives that we've had up to this point. Um, so without having to go through and do all of these calculations, these are essentially the expected values that we would see. So expected value for this cell would be 146. Expected value for this cell would be 146.35, right? Again, it makes sense that these expected values are very close to each other because the number of people in each of the exposure groups is pretty much the same. So this 0 0.01 difference down here is just due to the fact that there's one more person in this group as compared to the other. Um, so you can go through. Can you go back to that one? Yeah, absolutely, sure. I, I guess what I'm kind of confused about is the, um, the formulas uh -huh. are slightly different than what is normally in the two by two table. Okay, so let's think about this. Um, so we have a three by two table here, and we know the total number of people, which is 33,109. So what we're doing here in this first one, 11,037 divided by 33,109, that's telling us what information? Um, yep. Yeah, proportion of people who had aspirin or who were in the exposure aspirin group. What does the 439 divided by 33,109 tell us? Yes, okay. So this is, this value here, this probability here multiplied by this probability here is the joint probability, right? It's the joint probability of having the event and being in the aspirin exposure group. Well, if we multiply the probability by the total number of people that were in the study, we're going to get an expected count. Does that make sense as to where that's coming from? So for each one of these, we are, and so for the next one, we're taking 11,038 divided by, again, so this right here is producing our joint probability, and we're multiplying it by the total number of people in the study. Okay, So that's generating an expected count for each one of these cells. Maybe I'm just lost on the math question. When you did a two by two table, you're dividing by the total number. Um, so we are. Okay, so think about it like this. <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have written this out a little more clearly. So think about how this would actually work. If we had 33, 109 multiplied by 11,037 divided by 33, 109 times. Or I don't even know, is this 37? Okay, 439 divided by 33,109. So if you wanted to simplify this, you could just eliminate those. Okay, and in that case, so really they're the same, same process. We just eliminated this particular step for ease of calculation. Okay, so the calculation, the system, the process we're using is still the same. It just happens that we're just eliminating this extra step of calculation. So we're still taking this count here by this count here and divided by the total number here. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I will try to clarify that and post a new version of the slides. Okay, so I think that is going to be... So what's happening here is that we're using the same process that we did before. We are finding the expected count for each cell, and we know what the observed count is, 
and we're going through and we're generating our chi-squared statistic based on those same calculations we did in a 2x2 table, except here it's in a 3x2 case. So we're generating a test statistic, and for 25.05, again, that's a pretty large number. Um, now, the difference being, we have two degrees of freedom now, right? And that is due to working with a 3 by 2 table rather than a 2 by 2 table. And so it's not material enough to affect our conclusion here because the chi-squared test statistic is so large. But um, when you start getting maybe uh, questions that are more borderline, you'd have to start being careful to pay attention to the degrees of freedom. Okay? So what I am going to do, I'm going to pause there, um, and Julian will probably recap some of the things we discussed today, um, pick up from here, and I'm not sure if uh, on Wednesday he'll plan to get into some uh, sort of prefacing the uh, correlation and linear regression.